QAnon and the conspiratorial games people play, political ones involving Donald Trump's mega Republicans. Plus, Vladimir Putin's threats go nuclear, and Iranian women defy the authorities and set fire to their hijabs. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. We begin with Donald Trump and the QAnon conspiracy movement, a relationship that has gone from occasional flirtation on the ex-president's part to more of an open embrace. Last week at a rally in Ohio, Trump's people played a song that is associated with QAnoners. It was music to their ears. The group's members somehow believe that a secret cabal of the rich and powerful, people they say are pedophiles, actually runs the U.S. government and that Trump is their only chance to stop them. The movement also happens to be home to some deeply toxic white supremacists and anti-Semites. The FBI has warned about its links to violence in the country. After being forced off mainstream social media, QAnon's followers have fled to the outer reaches of the Internet. Since then, QAnon's gamification of reality has morphed into some more pragmatic goals, such as electing certain politicians, and its beliefs have been absorbed into radicalized parts of Trump's Republican Party. Our starting point this week is Youngstown, Ohio. Until last weekend, the political love affair between Donald Trump and QAnon was conducted, for the most part, with a wink an occasional nod after years of flirting with the movement's wild conspiracy theories. Stay tuned, everybody. Stay tuned. Trump took it a step further at a rally in Ohio. The soundtrack playing beneath part of his speech is a song called Where We Go One, We Go All. There is no victory we cannot have. We will not bend. We will not break. That phrase, known by its acronym, WWG1WGA, serves as a mantra to QAnon's followers. True to form, Trump's spokesman denied the obvious link. But if it wasn't that song that was playing, why would so many in the crowd seem to recognize it and raise one finger in response in what many have concluded is some kind of QAnon salute? Trump's team has claimed that the song used was uh, a song called Mirrors. We are a nation that allowed Russia to devastate a country, Ukraine, killing hundreds of thousands of people. We have checked and Mirrors and WWG1WGA are the same. They're the same song. Um, we've confirmed that through a program we used. Um, they're the same song. After we reported the song is the same, they've continued to use it. People who were in that audience knew exactly what was going on. Even if Trump didn't, uh, and that's what's so scary here, is that Trump is reacting to things where he sees people praising him, which is really at the foundation of this man's cracked ego, because they are almost religiously dedicated to him. And he doesn't recognize that he's getting deeper and deeper into QAnon. At worst, he does recognize it and he's part of it. The downplaying of the song is almost besides the point. It's over a hundred times now that Trump and his team have retruthed, as they call it on their platform, posts by QAnon influencers posts that contain a cue or the slogan, where we go on, we go all. Whoever runs his campaign is very aware of these references and Trump is very aware that this is a valuable part of his base. It's very possible that this is also part of the calculation for Trump. If he's having financial difficulties, this QAnon group is a ready and dedicated crowd. So it could be reflecting either he wants to motivate his base or he needs money or both because there's always a grift when Trump is involved. In another sign of his tacit support, just four days before that rally, Trump reposted an image of himself wearing a Q-pin on his lapel, along with language evocative of the movement. 
For journalists, summarizing the beliefs of QAnon members without sounding pejorative can be a real challenge. But let's try. They insist that the Trump White House was engaged in a secret war with the deep state, that his enemies were Democrats, devil worshippers led by Hillary Clinton and Hollywood elites, a cabal that abducts children to sexually abuse and eat. QAnon first emerged in 2017 on 4chan. When mainstream social media outlets banned them from their platforms, QAnon conspiracists took to more fringe sites like Gab, Rumble, and Trump's own Truth Social, leaving the censors behind. The content has evolved. QAnon now provides one-stop shopping online for a whole range of conspiracies. The visible aspects of the movement become more extreme when you push them to platforms that have less censorship, because they're reaching less of a large audience and in that small pond, they feel more comfortable communicating in ways that are openly anti-Semitic um, or openly embrace, you know, some of these more extreme white supremacist viewpoints. The same thing happens with uh, uh, any extremist organization. With the traditional social media platforms banning QAnon, they have been isolated into small corners. They isolate, isolate, isolate until finally they're only talking to each other. Self-brainwashing. The QAnon adherents haven't gone away at all. And in fact, the number has appeared to have grown. But it's become almost like a mass movement. Uh, according to the surveys that have been done by AEI, American Enterprises Institute, and the Institute for the Study of Religion, QAnon could be 15% of the American adult population, which is 30 million people. And that's a lot of people who believe in this crazy conspiracy theory. So I think it's important that we also understand it's not just low information voters, and it's not necessarily stupid people. 30 million adults, potential voters in a politically divided country, and the U.S. midterm elections take place six weeks from now. The establishment puppets of the D.C. swamp have waged a war against American success and independence. QAnon candidates, or at least Republicans willing to cozy up to the movement, are on more and more ballots, an estimated 78 candidates in 26 states. It's time to make America dominant again. This is not just Trump. Um, there are numerous QAnon supporting uh, candidates for office throughout the country, for Congress, for Secretary of State, for governorships. I'm Tina Forty. I'm a wife, mother, grandmother, and small business owner. I'm running for Congress to challenge the establishment and fight for you. Some have been elected already. A Republican nominee for governor of Arizona, Carrie Lake, has gone on to a QAnon show. So I appreciate that you had me on today. It's always a pleasure to be on with Greg. These figures uh, use the QAnon community, whether they believe it or whether they see it for some type of political gain. If I were to describe the shift in the movement in QAnon terms, they've gone from trust the plan to we are the plan. You need to be involved in your local committees. You need to be involved in your local school boards. You need to be running for local office. That is the main difference that we see with this movement. It has both kind of merged with a Republican push for local positions, but has also become more tangible and less of a armchair movement. What will be interesting is that because they say that elections were stolen, that the um, voting machines were taken over by Chavez in Venezuela, even though he's dead, or that we cannot trust the outcome of the elections, there is a danger that the most loyal QAnon supporters will not vote because they think the vote is wasted. They've been pushing a narrative that if they genuinely believe it, the Republicans will lose this voting bloc instead of being able to rely on the voting bloc. They are a new fringe conspiracy theory group called QAnon. Initially, Americans failed to take QAnon with its talk of cabals, pedophiles, and the deep state seriously. That should have changed in 2021, on January 6th, when the group was at the heart of the insurrection on Capitol Hill. 
But some Republicans simply cannot resist flirting with a conspiratorial movement that also appeals to white supremacists and anti-Semites. There's an alignment there, votes to be had, hence the nods, the winks, the musical soundtrack. And that is as good a measure as any of America's moral decline, its diminishing democracy. What political party in history has associated itself with an organization identified by the FBI as a terrorist threat? You know, just think about that for a minute. We already have QAnon members who are in Congress, in state government. If Donald Trump becomes president, we are going to have QAnon members at the highest reaches of government. And that is not the time to start asking questions about who these people are. It is time now. We are at a point in history we have never been in before. And instead of confronting it, people are overlooking it because of its absurdity. It's not absurd. It's dangerous. To Russia now. Vladimir Putin's threat this past week thinly veiled that the Kremlin has not ruled out using nuclear weapons to protect its people is still reverberating overseas and has also had consequences at home. Johanna Hus is here with the details. Richard, President Putin used a television address to issue that threat after Russian troops retreated following a successful counteroffensive by Ukrainian forces. Putin announced the mobilization of 300,000 men from Russia's reserve, the first such move since World War II, and he had to find a way to explain that. Washington, London, Brussels, прямо подталкивают Киев к переносу военных действий на нашу территорию. Just six months ago, Putin vowed that reservists would not be called to fight. So this U-turn provoked thousands of Russians to come out in protest. One of the issues protesters have been angered by is that pro-war Kremlin elites and members of their families aren't being drafted. That inspired a prank call, live-streamed on YouTube by supporters of jailed opposition politician Alexei Navalny, to the son of one of Putin's top officials, Press Secretary Dmitry Peskov. Это военный комиссариат с вами разговаривает. Вы сейчас можете говорить? Вам сегодня была отправлена повестка, в том числе и госуслуги, и на бумаге она к вам приходила, и вы пока еще не отозвались. А там был указан номер, по которому вы должны перезвонить и завтра в 10 утра явиться в военный комиссариат. Председатель, что я господин Песков, да. насколько это не совсем правильно, чтобы я там находился. Угу. Короче, я буду это решать на это самое, я буду это решать на другом уровне. Можно ставить галочку «Согласен пойти добровольцем на фронт»? While Putin's stance on mobilization has changed, what hasn't is how the Kremlin and its propagandists on the airwaves justify Russia's actions. Putin in his speech clearly stated that we are not fighting with the current Ukrainian political regime, but with the NATO countries. The goal of the West is to destroy Russia. They're still blaming the West and NATO for the war in Ukraine. But Russia's recent military setbacks have made it challenging for those pro-war TV hosts. Sticking to the official line, for example, that this is not a war, just a special military operation, one which Russia is threatening to take nuclear, is a tough one to sell, even on Russia's state-controlled airwaves. Thanks, Joe. Back to QAnon now and the conspiratorial mindset. Journalists have spent a lot of time trying to understand how so many Americans have come to believe in conspiracy theories. One of the more interesting takes we've come across is from a game designer, Reid Berkowitz. In QAnon, Berkowitz sees a world similar to the ones he creates in ARGs, alternate reality games. His analysis, an essay we asked him to adapt for television, explains a lot about the way our flawed minds work and how easily we can be dragged down the conspiratorial rabbit hole. I am a game designer with experience in a very small niche. I create and research games designed to be played in reality. Fictions designed to feel as real as possible. Puzzles where the deeper you dig, the more you find. Games with rabbit holes that invite you into Wonderland and entice you through the looking glass. When I saw QAnon, 
I knew exactly what it was and what it was doing. I had seen it before. I had almost built it before. It was gaming's evil twin. A game that plays people. QAnon uses the form and techniques of alternate reality gaming, ARG. The QAnon universe has a game-like feel to it that is evident to anyone who has ever played an ARG or an online roleplay. However, Q is not a game. QAnon is like the reflection of a game in a mirror. It looks just like one, but it is inverted. In one of the very first experience fictions I ever designed, the players had to explore a creepy basement looking for clues. The object they were looking for was barely hidden, and the clue was easy. As the participants started searching for the object they had hidden, they spotted little random scraps of wood on the floor that happened to make the shape of a perfect arrow, pointing right at a blank wall. It had to be a clue. Then it got worse. Since there obviously was no clue there, the group decided the clue they were looking for was in the wall. The collection of ordinary tools they found conveniently laying around seemed to enforce their conclusion that this was the right direction. It was all random chance, but I could see the connections that had been made were all completely logical. These were normal people, and their assumptions were normal and logical and just completely wrong. They had not found a clue. They had created one. Psychologists have a name for this kind of syndrome. They call it apophenia. Apophenia is the tendency to perceive a connection or meaningful patterns between unrelated or random things. In QAnon, that's the point. It isn't about finding the clues and solving the puzzles. It's about confusing people into tearing down walls. If you are a designer and have puzzles and have a plot, then apophenia is a wild card you always have to be concerned about. QAnon is a mere reflection of this dynamic. Here, apophenia is the point of everything. There are no scripted plots. There are no puzzles to solve created by game designers. There are no solutions. They are constantly getting the player lost by pointing out unrelated random events and creating a meaning for them that fits the propaganda message Q is delivering. Q is everybody. We don't know who particularly Q is. Q is a, a movement. Okay? It says think for yourself. It doesn't tell you to follow a one leader. You can think about what you want with Q. Q is a fictional character in a fictional game. A real whistleblower with important information would get it out as fast as possible to the most reliable source possible. There are people like Daniel Ellsberg, Edward Snowden, and Chelsea Manning. They don't drop clues and make you solve puzzles to look at the information. Q does, though. He does this because he is not a whistleblower. Q is a fictional character and acts exactly like a fictional character. This is because the purpose of Q is not to divulge actual information, but to create fiction. Let's take a look at how this works. To create apophenia, first you need random data. The more, the better. Then you need to interpret that data in a way that leads you to a false solution that fits the narrative. In several Q drops, Q tells followers that there is a shadowy cult out there in which the members are required to reveal their status through symbolism, like owls and horned animal heads. Q asks them to look out for these symbols and jewelry, tattoos, or hand gestures of public figures and celebrities. Of course, Q knows what they'll find. The Clintons throwing the rock and roll hand horns, Jay-Z flashing the Illuminati sign, the Rothschilds wearing horned heads at fancy dress costume parties, the images pile up fast. Clue after clue points the investigators to mountains of out-of-context images of the people they distrust, totally looking like they are in a cult. There is no doubt about the political nature of this propaganda either. This is the Internet's repurposing of hatred's greatest hits. It isn't an isolated process, but done in a large community of like-minded people. They share their finds and get showered with compliments, encouragement, and praise. They post images, trade theories, create memes, Photoshop the images into crazy quilts of people wearing owls and goat heads and pentagrams. 
They may not believe it at first, but as they watch endless music videos of the Hollywood elite, covered in occult symbolism, screaming about drugs and demons, a doubt grows. Doubts are notoriously hard to get rid of. The ideas start to surround them. A majority of people they know believe, at least partly, in QAnon-inspired conspiracies. All their news feeds echo the same thing. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and all over Twitter. OAN and Newsmax are reporting on it. QAnon is becoming a widely accepted system of beliefs, the new mainstream. If they ever lose faith, there are senators and even the former president of the United States talking about what a great movement QAnon is. I've heard these are people that love our country. Eventually, they just stop fighting it. They finally accept what is right before their eyes and what explains so much and what everyone around them is also seeing and telling them is the truth. It's an international satanic cult. And this is the moment of apophony. Only this is delusion as revelation. There's a reason that people enjoy doing puzzles, one most of us aren't aware of. When we solve puzzles, we get a hit of dopamine. It biochemically anchors the idea into our mind in a way that conveys certainty and gives us the motivation to solve more puzzles. It's that feeling you experience when you get the lawnmower to work or when you solve a hard puzzle in a great game. The problem is, we also get the same rush when we solve a puzzle incorrectly, but think we've got it right. Unlike the puzzles in a real game that have real solutions, there is no reality here, no solution in the real world. Instead, this is a breadcrumb trail away from reality, away from actual solutions, and towards a dangerous psychological rush. It works because when you figure it out yourself, you own it. Because you've experienced the thrill of discovery, the excitement of the rabbit hole, the acceptance of a community that loves and respects you. Because you were convinced to connect the dots yourself, you can see the absolute logic of it. It's a feeling that game designers are always chasing, giving players the ability to live in a world of magic that is vibrant and alive with potential. A world that reveals itself to you day by day. A world you can understand and have a role in. I can't believe people won't give that feeling up without a fight. Whatever happens with Trump or QAnon, one thing is certain. The gaming techniques employed in QAnon are simply too effective to be forgotten. The genie is out of the bottle. It may not be Q, but the gamification of propaganda will continue to evolve. This is just the beginning. And finally, Iran and the story of a young woman named Masa Amini. She was 22 years old. Her crime was her failure, according to the laws of the Islamic Republic, to properly wear her hijab. She died after getting beaten by the so-called morality police. Amini's name has turned into a hashtag, a rallying cry for a protest movement. City after city had thousands taken to the streets. True to form, the Iranian authorities have disrupted and blocked access to social media and the internet. Nonetheless, Iranians, women in particular, are telling this story from abroad. Here are a few places to find them, starting on Twitter. Nazanin Ansari is a journalist who runs Kehan Live, an English-language Iranian outlet based in London. Roya Burumand is a human rights activist and educator. Her organization, Iran Rights, advocates for political prisoners. Mariam Memar Sadiki is an activist, artist, and podcast host based in Canada. For a useful overview, the Washington Post has tracked the spread of the demonstrations as well as key social media content. Tehran Bureau is an online magazine associated with the Columbia School of Journalism in New York. It's out to improve English language coverage of Iran and has a media section worth checking out. The Iran Podcast is another project aiming to correct the mainstream narrative. It's run by Iranian-American journalist and analyst Negar Mortasavi. We talked about the dehumanization and the demonization of Iranians in the political... They're all tracking the protest story in Iran. So are we. We'll see you next time here at the Listening Post.